Hello everyone, this is Kevin Zhao, your finance professor at MTSU. We are in the fifth week of the study, and in this week, I want you to know that you have three things to do. First of all, you need to go through three chapters. Chapter 21, Valuing Financial Services Company. Chapter 22, Valuing Firms with the Negative and the Abnormal Earnings. And Chapter 3, Valuing Young and Startup Firms. That's the first thing that you needed to do. Please uh, look at my videos and uh, PowerPoint presentation files, as well as reading chapters. Uh, while you're reading chapters, I want you to pay a lot of attention to those illustrations. And the second, uh, you have uh, exam three ready uh, for this week. Uh, exam three. I would be uh, would it be similar to your exam too. You need to spend a lot of time fixing those problems. Uh, I would expect you to spend more than five hours on your third exam as you did in your second exam. And on average, the class did a really good job on your uh, second exam. I really appreciate that you spend a lot, a lot of times addressing a lot of details on those individual problems. And uh, the review is ready for you to view after you submit your uh, submit your second exam. Uh, so that's uh, that's exam problems and the questions. Once again, do not do not wait until the deadline to work on your problem the problem the questions in your in your exams. And I want you to do that chapter by chapter. And after this week, you should be able to fix uh, at least half of those problems. In your third exam, so that's uh, exam problems, questions, and uh, finally, uh, I want you to spend a lot of time on your evaluation project. And during this week, you should be able to uh, complete your work on the valuation models for the company that you're analyzing. And previously, you got your parameters ready. And the last week, you got your financial analysis ready, and right now it's time for you to put everything into your valuation models. Uh, in your valuation models, I want you to use at least two approaches. The first one is cash flows, uh, cash flow based models, and you can use free cash flow to the firm model or other models such as DBM or. Uh, Free cash flow to equity model, and typically you want to use two-stage model. And the second, I want you to also uh, check your valuation by using multiple multiple methods such as P/E ratio, PB ratio, EV to EBITDA ratio, so on and so forth, to double check if your previous valuation is reasonable or not. And uh, typically, uh, a professional analyst will use multiple methods to come up with the estimation of stock prices. And then they will assign weights on each every method to get an average estimated stock price. And I and I want you to do that uh, in a similar fashion. After you got your valuation uh, valuation uh, model ready, uh, got your estimated stock price. And one additional thing that you could do is so called sensitivity analysis. And the sensitivity analysis gives you sense on how your target price will change depending upon. The change of your key input variables. Such, uh, for example, if you assume that equity risk premium equals 5.5 percent in your valuation model, then what you could do for sensitivity analysis is that you assume that your uh, equity risk premium uh, can go as low as 5 percent and uh, go as high as 6.5 percent. So for each uh, each half percent. Change in your ERP, uh, you wanted to see how your target price changes as well. And uh, other variables you wanted to uh, do a uh, sensitivity analysis would be the growth rate, and the growth rate is very uh, very critical uh, in determining stock prices. And uh, sometimes you set your terminal growth rate as three percent, but uh, why not trying to see what the stock price would be if terminal growth rate. Uh, change it to 2.5 percent, 3.5 percent, so on and so forth. So that is a sensitivity analysis that you want to, uh, that I want you to do after you complete this uh, valuation models, right? And if you use multiples, if you use multiples, I want you to, uh, I want you to do two approaches. First one is 
regression approach to see what the reasonable multiple it should be, such as PB ratio or PE ratio, based on cross-sectional comparison. And the second, I want you to focus on a fundamental approach uh, to see what or what a fundamental P ratio should be based on those uh, fundamental variables such as payout ratio, growth rate, cost of equity, so on and so forth. So that is your uh, valuation work during this week. After this week, you should be able to wrap up your uh, valuation project. Next week, uh, during the sixth week, I want you to have a draft ready for your valuation project. If you if you could send it to D2L, then I can help you to look at it, and I will give you some suggestions on how to improve your valuation project. Although it's not uh, required, and during the last week, you're gonna present your valuation project during the class, and you need to submit three files: valuation project in Word file. It's a written report, and then the Excel spreadsheet demonstrating your valuation work regarding parameter, uh, cost of equity, cost of capital, growth rate estimation, terminal value, as well as your valuation models. So that's an uh, Excel spreadsheet that you should uh, submit with your uh, valuation project. And finally, the PowerPoint presentation file to assist your presentation. So that's a valuation project. So if you haven't done a lot of work for your valuation project, I would say it's, it's still not too late. You have three weeks to, to, to complete this uh, valuation project and I want you to work very diligently with your teammates on this project. It's uh, very important. Okay, uh, this week uh, we began to discuss how to apply the principle that we learned during the previous weeks. Uh, to analyze some specific types of companies and we have five chapters to cover uh, for the last stage of the class where, uh, which, which, which we will do uh, during this week and the next week and this week we will cover three different types of companies financial services companies the companies with negative and uh, abnormal earnings as well as the young and the start startup companies. And then next week, we will learn how to value private firms and uh, distressed firms as well. So those are five specific types of companies that we are going to uh, evaluate based on the principles, mechanisms that we learned during the previous weeks. If you have any questions, send me an email or visit my office uh, during my office hours. And I'm always here to help you to achieve your academic success in this class. Okay, let's start with uh, let's start the discussion of chapter 21, valuing financial services companies. Okay, and uh, uh, I mean, why why financial services company? First of all, it's very important because uh, when you look at the sector distribution of U.S. Uh, U.S. stock market, you will find that the financial sector is one of the largest one. And uh, if you if you utilize standard and poor's categorization of sectors, then you will see ten sectors in this economy. And uh, the largest three sectors are the first one is information technology, which account for about a little over twenty percent of 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 active value on the stock market, I would say information technology account for more than 20% of the U.S. economy. Followed by, followed by, uh, healthcare sector. Healthcare sector is pretty big, about 13%, and the financial sector about 15% as well. So financial sector is a very important sector in this economy. Although the trend is that. The, the the weight of financial services in this economy is declining gradually back to year 2000, uh, year 2007, year 2008, that weight actually was as high as 20%, but right now it declined to 15%, but still a very significant sector in, uh, in this economy and on the stock market. So financial services companies are important because uh, the weight is pretty high in this economy. 
And also, the financial services companies are very unique comparing to other types of businesses. And here are major types of financial services companies. They are uh, commercial banks such as Bank of America, Wells Fargo, or First Tennessee. They 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 take deposit from depositors and uh, lend money to businesses and households as well. So that's a commercial banking business and a second type of business is insurance company such as property insurance company, vehicle insurance company and healthcare insurance companies. And the third type of financial service company are investment banks. Investment banks uh, do three basic type of businesses. First of all is uh, it's called a corporate financing business or investment banking business. They help corporations to raise capital through uh, debt insurance or stock insurance. And investment banks also do trading businesses for their for their clients. It's called a brokerage business. And if you have brokerage account, then you need to set that. Uh, you need to open. Uh, you need to work with a typical investment bank. Uh, for you to do equity investment, bond investment, so on and so forth. So that's uh, brokerage services. And the third one is asset management businesses. Investment banks help their clients to trade stocks or invest in other assets in their pension plan, in their retirement plan, so on and so forth. So that's asset management businesses. And uh, those are three traditional businesses that investment banks do. And the fourth type of business is called risk management. And risk management business involves using financial derivatives uh, to help uh, clients such as corporations or governments or individuals to manage their uh, business risk or financial risk. That's uh, four basic types types of business investment banks that do. And in Middle Tennessee, we have a large investment bank. It's called a UBS. It's a Swiss. Uh, it's a Switzerland bank, but uh, this Swiss, uh, Switzerland bank expands very aggressively globally. And previously, the headquarters of US uh, US business unit is in New York City, but they moved their headquarters to Nashville many years ago, about 10 years ago. And uh, they recruit MTSU MTSU students uh, aggressively during the past. And uh, if you find a job at UBS, you will find a lot of alumni from MTSU. Uh, they do very typical investment banking business. And the first type of uh, first type of uh, type of financial services company are so-called investment companies. Uh, they do asset management businesses for their clients. They trade stocks, uh, from other and other financial assets for their clients. Uh, typically, pension plan, uh, retirement plan. And government funds on sports and uh, they manage so-called mutual funds they manage so-called mutual funds and some of the companies do hedge fund management uh, so that's uh, four basic types of financial services companies financial services companies are pretty unique in the following three aspects the first one is uh, the debt. When you look at the debt, uh, it's very different. And for a typical manufacturing company, debt is source of capital. But uh, for financial services company, the debt is not only the source of capital, but also the raw material because bank use the, the deposit that they get from uh, uh, depositors to make loans, to make loans or make other investments. So. Uh, regarding firm value and equity value, it's more important for you to look at its uh, firm value because bank has a lot of debt. Right? Bank has a lot of debt. Investment bank also has a lot of debt, uh, debt as well. And uh, that's uh, one very special uh, aspect of, uh, of financial service companies. And uh, typically, a regular firm wanted to maintain a healthy uh, leverage ratio. By maintaining low level of debt, in that case, business risk can be reduced. But for a bank, they cannot do that. And a typical commercial bank will have 90% of capital uh, raised by debt. And uh, the more debt that they have, the more profitable or more sales of their businesses. If company wanted to reduce debt, that is uh, that is bad because they will uh, they will make their uh, make their sales to decline, profit to decline, so on and so forth. So, 
that is uh, is a source of the raw material. They use that to make loans. That's one very unique aspect of natural services companies. And the second, uh, there's a uh, there's a great ra regulatory concerns for banking companies. And all banking companies need to maintain certain capital ratio, maintain certain capital ratios, and uh, they have a lot of constraints regarding what kind of financial assets they can invest it in. Uh, and those are regulated by the current laws and regulations and also there's a strict business licensing uh, for banking businesses and a bank has to have either federal license or state license to run their banking businesses in certain areas. So that's a regulatory concerns for financial services companies. And the last one is reinvestment. And the reinvest reinvestment of banking companies are very, uh, very different from a regular companies. When invest, uh, when a bank uh, do capital uh, capital reinvestment or capital expenditure, it's unlikely that a bank will invest large amount of money in those fixed uh, assets or tangible assets such as the building, such as equipment, so on and so forth. They use smaller amount of money. To, to invest in equipment such as the PCs, computers, information system, but they spent a lot of money, spent a lot of money to invest in so-called capital, equity capital, in order to attract more deposits. And uh, so regarding all those natures, it's really hard for uh, for an analyst to estimate its cash flows in a banking company. Typically, for a regular company, if cash flows are high, then stock valuation will be higher. But for bank companies, uh, high cash flow is not a good thing because high cash flow means that some cash flow are not efficiently utilized for their loan businesses, and they wanted to reduce. I mean, if a bank want to reduce total amount of cash that they that they are holding, they want to lend as much as possible uh, the cash that they are holding. So those are very unique aspects of financial services companies. Now let's take a look at the valuation uh, framework. Uh, we have three major type of methods uh, related to cash flow based model, FCFE, FCFF, and uh, for banking company, FCFE is a better choice because bank has typically a large amount of capital raised by debt. And uh, so FCFC could be a better choice. Uh, doesn't mean 100% uh, uh, accurate, but uh, the better choice than FCFF. And for DDM, uh, for DDM, sometimes you may use DDM, but uh, remember to incorporate stock repurchases uh, with a dividend. Uh, for this dividend discounting model, you treat the total cash flow that a company distributes distributed through both stock repurchase and dividend as source of cash in your dividend discounting model. And regarding the growth rate, you should look at its uh, retention ratio which includes both stock repurchases and the dividends uh, as well as ROE. Right? And uh, for a typical bank, they have high payout ratio because most banks are mature business, there's uh, not much room for them to grow uh, in the future. Therefore, low growth rates, high payout ratios are expected. And uh, regarding beta, uh, you wanted to look at its fundamental beta based on its uh, leverage as well as operating le uh, financial leverage and operating leverage as well. So, in I mean, we are in the last stage of the study, and uh, we have five chapters to cover, and each chapter involves uh, different type of firms. And for different type of firms, we do have different type of tools to deal with. It. And uh, so, in this part, I mean, in those chapters, I want you to spend more time looking at those illustrations. Those, those illustrations show you great examples on how to apply certain uh, certain tools to evaluate certain type of companies. Okay, here's one example. HSBC back to year 2000 and here we use DDM model. So what is HSBC? HSBC is a 
British bank, a British global bank. And in the U.S., they have a lot of business. It's one of the largest bank, not only globally, but uh, in the U.S. as well. And uh, the, the full name of HSBC is very uh, interesting. Uh, it's a British bank, right? global bank, British bank. Uh, but the name is called Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. Yeah, it has nothing to do with UK. It looks like this Chinese bank, but actually it's not. Uh, previously, the headquarter of HSBC Bank is in Hong Kong, but uh, it was transferred to London as, uh, many years ago. Uh, the, the reason why it's called HSBC is because this bank was established back to 19th century. And uh, the prosperity of this bank was associated with uh, business expansion in Eastern Asian area, especially in Hong Kong and in Shanghai. So uh, that's a little back background information about HSBC, it's a British bank, uh, which carries uh, names of Chinese cities like Hong Kong and Shanghai. But this bank has significant uh, business existence in the U.S. It's one of the largest banks in the U.S. as well. So here's some information about this company. EPS 74.8 pences back to year 2010 and uh, the currency is UK currency. The dividend was 36 pences, 36 pences. As you see, uh, the payout ratio is pretty high. Uh, almost half of EPS was distributed as a dividend, not uh, not uh, not not including uh, stock repurchases. And the beta is equal to 1. Uh, so this is a very stable bank. Uh, it's a large bank, mature the bank. Uh, it's value company. So the riskiness is equivalent to the market average. Risk free rate back to year 2010 was 4%. And we use 5.5% active market risk premium. And we assume stable growth rate 3.5%. How do you get that 3.5%? This is a very sensitive factor in our valuation. Right, and uh, here once again you look at uh, several aspects of the growth rate. First of all, historical level of the growth rate during the last you know, 20 years. That's uh, one way for you to estimate a future growth rate. And the second one is to look at uh, the expected economic growth plus expected inflation rate. Right? That gives you another growth rate estimation. And here you look at the fundamentals, fundamentals of the growth. So here we use one simple stage model. Uh, <coughs> uh, dividend 36 pence times 1 plus the growth rate divided by the difference between cost of equity, uh, which is 9.5%, and the growth rate of 3.5%, which will give you 621 pence uh, target price of HSBC. Very simple example. So here's one stage. Uh, you may you may add I, I mean you uh, you may argue that okay uh, for HSBC their earnings gonna be very volatile right and how can you use uh, use this uh, stable growth model I would say this uh, uh, constant uh, constant growth model or stable growth model actually give you a pretty good approximation on what will happen for this band in the next 10, 20, 30 years because in year 2010 we are about in the middle of the business cycle. This, so this uh, this year is a very typical year uh, in a business cycle or average year. It's not a good, uh, ex extremely good year or extremely bad year. It's kind of average and if you take this as starting point then we use one step, I mean, uh, I mean this constant growth model uh, it could give you a pretty good uh, approximation of the stock value and uh, you simply smooth out what will happen for the next couple of business cycles and take the average and uh, the valuation could be very reasonable so that's a constant growth model based on dividend and stock repurchases and here we don't include stock, stock repurchases because HSBC as a British bank, they don't do a lot of stock repurchases. But if a bank has a lot of uh, fund uh, <coughs> involved in stock repurchases, then you have to treat that amount of money as, as alternative dividends in your valuation model.
Now let's take a look at FCFE model. FC, FCFE model is based on free cash flow to equity, but uh, uh, this model is a little challenge because uh, it sometimes is really hard for you to estimate capital expenditure in order to uh, in order to estimate free cash flow to equity. Right. And regarding them, uh, they have two main uh, areas where they do capital expenditure, and uh, and uh, the most important one is the investment in reg regulatory capital. Because if a bank wanted to attract more deposit, they needed to invest in the regulatory capital first. So if they don't do equity investment, then there's no way they can <coughs> they can attract more deposit because that's required by the law. They need to maintain certain level of regular regulatory capital ratio in order to comply with the current regulation. And the second area for the uh, for a bank to do capital uh, capital investment is hiring people. Hiring people. That's the most important investment that uh, financial services companies are invested in. They don't do a lot of investments in physical assets. I mean, they don't need a physical assets. If they need a build, uh, if they need a building, they rent it. Right? Uh, <clears throat> let's say, hey, you see, uh, you see, uh, uh, Bank of America, uh, big logo in one of the tallest building in Nashville. So you, a lot, a lot of people may say, hey, Bank of America own that building, but, but actually they don't. They don't even own one floor of that building. They simply put their advertisement, uh, uh, uh be abroad on the top of the building. And uh, that's that's not the main area that they make their investment. They make investment in human capital. That's the most important asset that they have. Uh, talented financial professionals working for bank. That's the most valuable asset that, uh, that any bank has. Uh, the I mean that's a uh, that's a human resource uh, investment, which is another important area where bank make capital investment. So let's take a look at a two-stage model for Deutsche Bank in year 2009. So where's Deutsche Bank? Deutsche Bank is German. Is a, a German bank. Uh, it had a quarter in Frank Frankfurt in Germany, but uh, it has global expansion into other areas. It's one of the largest bank in the U.S. as well. Uh, let's take a look at what happened in year 2008 because uh, we suppose uh, in year 2009 doing valuation for this bank. Uh, in year 2008, this company had 3.8 billion US dollar losses. Uh, it, it paid a dividend. Uh, it paid a dividend. Uh, the beta is 1.16, slightly higher than market average, uh, given risk free rate of 3.6%, active risk premium 6%. We can estimate its cost of equity. And we, we, we project that net income will bounce back to 3.147%, uh, uh, 3.147 million US dollars in the next year when economy recovers and when economy expands. And ROE will be 10% with a 4% growth rate for the recovery time period between year 2009 to year 2003. So growth rate of 4% for the next 5 years. And uh, long term long term growth rate will be three percent starting year two thousand fourteen. And the reg regulatory capital ratio would be ten percent. It's required by the law. Uh, that means for each one dollar of equity this bank has, they can attract nine dollars of deposit. And based on that ten dollars, they can they can do their lending businesses. And uh, uh, I mean, current beta is 1.16, but uh, we do a little normalization. And for a typical large bank like Deutsche Bank, we would say, "Hey, bank will go towards one, go towards one." And we do cost of equity estimation based on uh, this uh, this this normalized beta. Okay, here is the table that we utilize to do this two-stage model, like any. Uh, problems that you solved in your second exam and uh, the third exam uh, as well. And uh, year 2008 is 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 year zero, and we have uh, three years of high growth time period, 09 to 13, five-year high growth time period with a four percent growth rate. Uh, 
uh, I mean for a banking company even when it has high growth rate you shouldn't get you shouldn't do a a double digit number because banking business is a really mature business so first of all we look at the total assets uh, total assets uh, in year 2008 is 312 billion US dollars okay this is the big bank the total asset we have is 300 billion US dollars and we expect that these assets will increase uh, based on 4% growth rate each every year for the next five years and then we look at a capital ratio to see what's the regulatory capital that they need right? and the uh, regulatory capital uh, number will change and the different the year to year difference represents the the capital reinvestment that that, uh, that this bank need to make to meet this regulatory uh, capital requirements. So in year 2009, they needed to invest a little over one billion US dollars uh, to to meet this regulatory requirement. And this number increases year by year. Uh, by year 2013, this bank needs to uh, uh, reinvest 1.3 billion dollars to comply with this regulatory capital uh, regulation. And ROE, ROE, uh, ROE currently is negative, but uh, we expect that ROE will increase to 10% in year 2013 from 9.5%. And uh, let's say this process is a gradual process when economy recovers and expands. That's a, a reasonable, uh, reasonable assumption, and then we multiply ROE with uh, the capital that will give you the expected net income, and from net income, you are able to calculate this FCFE, and uh, you simply minus regula regulatory capital in, uh, investment, assuming there will be uh, basically zero reinvestment in other areas such as such as human resources or equipment so on and so forth I mean, of course they do some investment in that area but, but uh, the magnitude of those investments are basically zero uh, relative to the, uh, the investment in this uh, regulatory capital and, um, and that income minus regulatory capital uh, reinvestment will give you an, an approximation of free cash flow to equity and uh, you have five year free cash flow to equity, and you can calculate uh, free cash flow to the firm in uh, year 2014, which is the beginning year of the second stage. Then you do present value calculation as well as terminal value calculation. And for the cost of equity during the high growth time period, you can use 1.16 as your beta. But for the stable time period, uh, we would expect that beta to decline towards one. Cost of equity will be lower during the stable time period. And uh, uh, the payout ratio equals one minus retention. Uh, I mean, a payout ratio equals one minus uh, retention ratio. Retention ratio equals growth rate divided by ROE. And we assume 10% ROE for this company, and that will uh, come up with 69% of payout ratio. Payout ratio. So the terminal value equals earnings uh, 3.87 billion US dollars times one plus growth rate, and the time this payout ratio that gave you uh, that gave you uh, the, the, the the free cash flow to the firm. Then you divide that number with the difference with uh, between cost of equity and growth rate to get 39.7 billion US dollar worth of terminal value. And that is that's a future value. You still need to discount it. Uh, you still need to discount it uh, to get 24 billion US dollar worth of uh, present value of the terminal value. And then you add up uh, the 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 value of uh, first stage and uh, the terminal value to come up with. 32.3 billion US dollar total value of this bank. Then divide by number of shares outstanding, you get 55.3, uh, 55.5 euros of target price on this European bank called Deutsche Bank. And through this process, I want you to pay attention on how 
uh, how you could uh, find out FCFE and the main part of FCFE is net income and regulatory capital reinvestment. So that's a very unique aspect of bank. If you use free cash flow to equity model. If a bank actually make a, a tremendous amount of reinvestment uh, on human resources or uh, information technology, then you need to add that investment uh, reinvestment into your into your analysis as well. So that's uh, two stage two stage estimation of large bank. Okay. Here is an alternative model that you can utilize for analyzing a bank company or financial services company. It's called access return model. And this model look at the current value of the equity, which is the book value of the equity, and then you uh, then you add the access return value, access return value of the equity. And this access return is from X I mean, by its name, is access return of a bank. Access of what? Access of its cost. Right? And here, the access return is the difference between return on equity and cost of equity. And the difference is the access return. And uh, you divide the number with equity, you got access return, the rate of access return. And you can calculate the present value of expected access return to shareholders uh, based on book value of that. And illustration 21.4 showed you the details of using this access return model to estimate a stock price of a, a well known investment bank, Goldman Sachs. Other than cash flow based models, we can use valuation multiples to do bank valuation and uh, you can use either P ratio or P V ratio. Uh, for P ratio, uh, for P ratio, stock price uh, is equal to estimated P ratio on expected earnings. So there are two things that you need to do. First one is to look at expected earnings per share for the next time period. Then multiply it with estimated P-E ratio. So how do you get this P ratio? Uh, there are two main methods that you can utilize. First one is through comparison or regression, cross-sectional regression. You collect data of many banks, many similar banks, traded on the market to see what their P ratios are based on firm characteristics variables such as payout ratio, growth rate, cost of equity, debt ratio, so on and so forth. Uh, that's one way that you can get a reasonable P ratio relative to the market through regression methods. And uh, I mean, when you do regression, you need to be very careful because here, the regression that we are going to do is so-called cross-sectional regression. You shouldn't do any time series regression. Let's say you regress P ratio uh, of a certain bank during the last 20 years, trying to find a trend, and I, and I would say that's not a correct method. What you need to do is, is so called cross sectional regression. You regress P ratio of many similar banks at one time, trying to figure out what's a reasonable P ratio for the bank you are analyzing. That's uh, a regression method for P ratio. And the second one is fundamental P ratio. You look at payout ratio, you look at the cost of equity and the growth rate. And the cost of equity has something to do with the beta. And uh, you do P ratio uh, estimation based on its fundamentals. Uh, P ratio equals payout ratio times 1 plus G divided by R minus G. That is a one uh, constant, growth, uh, constant growth model. Or you can use two stage model to estimate fundamental P ratio. And we learned that during the previous weeks. So that's a uh, PE multiple method. And for banking companies, if you are getting a P ratio of 40, you need to be careful because bank bank companies are mature businesses. It's more common for you to uh, find a P ratio between 10 or 15. And if, even for the well managed comp uh, banking companies, you might find that when it, even when economy is hot, their P ratio tend to be low. 
as 10 or 12 or as high as 15. 15 was considered as a high P ratio for a bank, right? And uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, for banking company, keep in mind that uh, most banking companies are large banks, are matured banks. There's not much room for, their, for them to grow, therefore a low P ratio is pretty common for a banking company. Other than P ratio, you, you can use PB ratio, and PB ratio is getting more and more popular for analysts to analyze a banking company. And sometimes PB ratio is better than PB ratio because PB ratio reveals, reveals the fundamental aspects of banking company's value. And uh, PB ratio can be decomposed into uh, the, uh, the, the equation that you see here, PB ratio equals the relative of ROE and the cost of equity and uh, both factors are strengthened by the growth rate so ROE minus G divided by cost of capital minus G ROE is return equity and R is cost of equity so here if a bank has has higher ROE than its, uh, than its cost of equity then the bank would generate a value for its shareholder and a PB ratio should be higher than 1. And during the financial crisis you see that a lot of banks are treated as discounted price of their book value. Let's say PB ratio equal to 0 0.6, 0 0.8, that's common because during the bad time bank has difficulty to create, uh, to create high return equity. Although their cost of, uh, cost of equity would be relatively high, but uh, 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 to, to, to generate a high ROE was pretty challenging when the economy was in bad shape. But when the economy recovers, uh, that ROE can be improved relative to cost of equity. And when ROE is higher than cost of equity, then you would expect that PB ratio will go above 1. So for a banking company, if you find a PB ratio around uh, anything above one, that means that's a good bank in a good time. And when economy is in bad shape, when market is in bear market, it's very common for you to see a banking company has PB ratio lower than one. And when PB ratio is lower than one, of course they that's a good deal, but maybe not because. Uh, if a bank cannot create ROE that is higher than return capital, then uh, the bank is, uh, is, is actually destroying value for shareholders. And the PB ratio is supposed to be low. So that's a PB ratio. Uh, you have cash flow based model, you have dividend discounting model, you have free cash flow to equity model, you have P ratio and P ratio. So, which one is the best method? Surprisingly, this PB ratio is the best method for evaluating a banking company among professional analysts. Right, so uh, we can uh, we complete this uh, chapter of, of value valuing financial uh, services companies. It's a very straightforward chapters uh, regarding theory. Not much theory to emphasize. Uh, we simply use the tools that we learned in previous chapters right, to deal with certain type of company. And certain type of company has certain uh, features that you need to pay attention for banking company. Uh, the nature of that, the nature of cash flows, right, and the nature of their growth. And the reg regulatory concerns on suppose those are very unique aspects of banks. And we incorporate those uh, unique issues into our evaluation. So that's... Uh, Chapter 21, and want you to look at illustrations in the chapter to see the details on those different methods that we use evaluating typical financial companies. I hope you enjoyed these videos, and uh, I think uh, overall our pace are slowing down, not as intensive as we went through during the first couple weeks, but uh, still we have a lot of work to do, and right now we are in the fifth week of the study. And it's time to it's time to accelerate a little bit, and we are going to rush to the end towards your academic success in this class. Once again, 
I'm Kevin Zhao. I'm here to help you guys to achieve your success in this class. I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, I will see you in next chapter. Thank you.